This is our fourth and final video on power law degree distributions in complex networks. We will talk about how to fit a power law to a data set and how to visualize a power law plot. Let's start by returning to our World Wide Web example, which exhibits some typical behaviors of power law data sets. First, the smallest degrees often don't follow the power law. So there is some minimum degree after which the law kicks in. Second, the highest degrees tend to be rather noisy. This can be due to undersampling, which cannot be avoided when dealing with rare events. Given our degree data, we want to find the best fitting power law distribution. Today we will talk about fitting a, a continuous power law distribution to data with a lower threshold after which the power law kicks in. Note that we don't know the exponent alpha or the threshold k min, so our fitting process must find both. Let's start by talking about one way to make a cleaner visualization. Our goal will be to compensate for the undersampling in the tail of the distribution. We will use a technique called logarithmic binning. This slide shows two log-log visualizations of the word frequencies in the novel Moby Dick. The plot on the right uses logarithmic binning to aggregate data points in a similar range. Here is how logarithmic binning works. We split the data into bins. The size of these bins are increasing powers of 2. So here we have a bin of size 1, and then we have a bin of size 2, and then we have a bin of size 4. Our next bins would have sizes 8, 16, 32, etc. We tally the number of data points in each bin. So in bin number 1 we have 6 ones, and in bin number 2 we have 6 numbers total, 5 of them are 2's and 1 is 3, and in the last bin we have 7 points. Next we divide each tally by the size of the bin. This gives us a proper count per unit interval. So we divide 6 by 1 to get 6, and we divide 6 by 2 to get 3 for the second one, and for the third one we're going to divide 7 by 4. Finally, we take the logarithm of these normalized bin tallies, and we now have a base 2 log log plot of our data set. Here is an algebraic formulation of the logarithmic binning process shown on the previous slide. You can see that we are using the average number of occurrences in each interval and then taking the logarithm. Since our bin sizes grow, we are using a huge bin for our largest data values. This evens out the noise in the tail for visualization purposes. So let's get down to business and talk about fitting a power law to our data. In many data sets, the power law doesn't apply for the smallest values that we see, and so we must find both the power law exponent and the lower threshold. Our first step is to show that this is the equation that we want to fit to find our continuous power law. So our goal is to find the proper normalizing constant c so that when we integrate over the proper interval, we get 1. The integral we must solve is fairly elementary. We just need to use the power rule from calculus. We will then multiply by k min over k min. This lets us write the power law as alpha minus 1 over k min multiplied by k min over k all raised to the alpha. So indeed, this is the function that we want to fit to our data. For now, let's assume that we already know the value for k min. We will come back to finding k min later in the video. We use this formula to find the best fitting power law exponent, alpha. To fit a discrete PMF, we make one small adjustment and subtract one half in the denominator. Here is the idea behind our maximum likelihood estimator formula. Given that we have observed this data set of n points, we want to work backwards. We are going to assume that the data we are looking for is typical for the governing distribution. That is, if we got a second sample of endpoints, then it would look very much like this sample. So we want to find the one distribution that is the most likely one to have produced our observed data. So that's what this equation is doing. I want to maximize the product of the p of ki's because that is the probability that I observed this particular data set. In our setting, we already have k min, so we need to find the best choice for the exponent alpha. So we would rather not deal with having alpha in the exponent. We can fix this by taking the log of both sides and then maximize that value instead. When we take the log, multiplication becomes addition and exponentiation becomes multiplication. And some simplification gets us this formula. 
and now alpha appears twice, once in this logarithm, and then once here multiplied by the sum of these constants. So how do I find the maximum value? Well, by taking the derivative and setting it equal to zero. And when I differentiate with respect to alpha, we get this expression. And I'll let you check that using your calculus skills. Rearranging gives the maximum likelihood estimator formula that we are looking for. So this formula really does find the best fitting power law exponent. So let's get back to finding the best value for k min. Here we will use a trial and error process. We will actually find the best fitting alpha for increasing values of k min, and then we will choose between them to find the best distribution. For this, we pick the distribution that is closest to the observed data set. We minimize the kolmogorov smirnov statistic, which measures the worst violation from among our fitted data. Writing code to find the value of alpha, the best fitting exponent, is pretty straightforward. Writing code to pick the best k-min value is a bit more work. But lucky for us, some of our industrious colleagues have already written Python and R packages to handle this for us. And I refer you to their documentation for further details. We end this video with a coda about fitting power laws to data. It is true that we can always fit a power law distribution to any data set, but this doesn't mean that a power law is the best distribution choice. In fact, there are other distributions that are quite close to being a straight line in a log-log plot. One example is the log-normal distribution. Now in the early days of network science, people were very excited about the discovery of power laws. Researchers would fit power laws and claim victory without asking whether there might be a better choice of distribution. It is true that these data sets are heavy-tailed, and this heavy tail is what leads to the existence of hub nodes. But people started to use the terms heavy-tailed and scale-free interchangeably. And as discussed in our last video, scale-free is equivalent to being a power law. And yes, every power law has a heavy tail. However, not every heavy-tailed distribution is a power law. In 2018, Broido and Clauset completed an exhaustive analysis of about a thousand network data sets. They found that pure power laws are not the best fit distribution for many of these complex networks. They gave a sliding scale of criteria and determined how well power laws fared compared to other models, including adaptations like the truncated power law in which the tail of the distribution does not go on forever. They found that only a handful of technological and biological networks can be called strongly scale-free. Now this paper has caused some controversy, and this is where the complex system of humanity comes into play. Some researchers, including Albert Laszlo Barabashi, have tied their reputation to having discovered a fundamental law of nature by recognizing the appearance of power laws in complex networks, and by coming up with compelling explanations for why this is an organizing principle of the universe. But of course, the real world is messy, and the devil is in the detail. These complex systems are complex, so there will be very few networks that are pure power laws. Broido and Clauset are championing more rigorous statistical analysis of complex data sets before calling them scale-free. It seems that some researchers feel threatened by this work, and they criticize the language being used. It appears to them that this is undermining their legacy rather than moving science forward. Some of this feud is publicly available, and I've included a link to a blog post by Barabashi on our course website. So why do we focus on power laws to explain the global structure of real-world networks? First, it's because they are the simplest answer. This idealized model becomes a straight line in the log-log plot, and it makes sense to start any investigation with the simplest possible model. Second, as we will see in future videos, power laws correspond to a very simple growth process that is easy to understand. This growing network model is built upon the principle that popular vertices gain an advantage, which reinforces their popularity as the network grows. Sometimes people refer to this as the rich get richer phenomenon. This term is evocative, but I will use it sparingly. The metaphor tacitly endorses a view that economic inequality is a natural and therefore benign state of affairs. So the third reason to look at power laws is that popularity reinforcement provides an organizing principle and a fundamental mechanism for how networks grow. Indeed, success breeds success, and sometimes breeding success involves fending off threats or competitors. One of the features of popularity reinforcement is that the early popular vertices will always have an advantage. It is all but impossible for a newer vertex to overtake the historical leaders. But these innovations do occur, even though power law models do not account for them. So power laws are a spectacular discovery, 
and the beginning of a long scientific conversation as we strive to make a little more sense of the complexity that surrounds us. But the story is not yet completely written.